Hello and welcome. Controversial director Alan Parker's movie hits have ranged from the musicals Fame and DeVita to the powerful Mississippi Burning and the devilishly dark Angel Heart with Robert De Niro and Mickey Rourke. Alan had a single-minded view of movie making, rarely wishing to repeat himself but always choosing powerful stories. The British-born director was originally an advertising copywriter in London, but it didn't take him long to transfer his creative talents to the big screen. His first feature film, a musical parody of gangster films called Bugsy Malone, had an all-kids cast, including a 13-year-old Jodie Foster. While the movie was not a smash hit worldwide, it certainly got Alan plenty of attention. And his next two films, the Oscar-winning Midnight Express and Fame, shot him into the top tier of Hollywood directors. They were followed by Shoot the Moon, Pink Floyd The Wall and Birdie. But then in 1986, he tackled the darkly complex voodoo thriller called Angel Heart with Robert De Niro and Mickey Rourke. I was lucky enough to go onto the set of the film down in New Orleans and spoke to Alan about the origins of the story and his experience working with De Niro and Rourke. Where did you play? Swedish or Scandinavian writer? No, he's American. It just happens to William Hjortsberg. He's got a Swedish name, but he's American. It was, uh, I was originally sent it a long time ago. It was a similar story to Birdie, but I was sent it when, in manuscript form right. and uh, never did it. And then a lot of people have owned this book. It was a very hot book for a while. You know, like Redford owned it for a long time. And they, uh, I don't know, they couldn't crack it from a script point of view. And then uh, Elliot Kastner uh, got the rights and... Uh, you know, we're all at, he's at Pinewood and we're at Pinewood, so I just put it on my desk, on my uh, table at lunch one day in the restaurant. And I remembered the book. I read it again and I thought, well, it'd be nice. I also wanted to write, you know, it's a long time since I've actually uh, written screenplay. Uh, you know, I rewrite everything. Mm. And so I thought for once maybe I ought to, you know, I was supposed to be a writer, so I should get down and do writing again. So it was nice. It was a, you know, it was a good book. Good. What's the, what's good the, beginnings. I mean, I've, I've read the synopsis, the treatment of it, but... Uh, what was it about the story that was intriguing? Well, I never, you know, I always try and do different things each time. I'd never done that genre of mystery or, or detective story. And it was classic sort of Chandler-esque thing. Yeah, I was going to say, and, it's uh, But it, it's, you know, it's totally, it has very strange twists and turns, which, which are outside of, of the strange, of the, of the conventional detective story. But it was just, I uh, always wanted to do that kind of, you know, that something from that genre and I never had the opportunity before really I mean I don't you know I suppose some people describe Midnight Express as a thriller but I never did you know so it's just wanting to attempt different things each time well, well, how would you describe Midnight, Midnight Express? Express I don't know psychological drama <laughs> yeah I suppose so yeah. but I mean it's certainly got thriller elements in it. sure yeah. yeah so what did the book also I gather was only contained in in the Harlem area or sort of New York, New York basically yeah. so what was the well, I read it, and uh, you know, a couple of times, and I thought to myself, well, if I'm as a as a director, it would be very difficult to do uh, a, an, a, a period detective story that's set in '55, um, all in New York, and and give it some cinematic edge, some difference, some originality. Mm. I just thought, oh no, not yet another. New York detective story it seems could be boring and also I'd, to open it up cinematically uh, a lot of the leads in the book led to New Orleans uh, and I spoke to William Hortzberg and he said he always thought at one point he would use New Orleans you know and he never did and uh, I quite like the idea in terms of uh, you know like change of seasons but like New York I've done very cold and snow and, you know everybody's got a thick overcoat and buttoned up and then the moment you hit New Orleans it's hot and steamy and in the story he gets closer and closer to hell so I thought it'd be nicer that it gets hotter and hotter you know? mm. Mm. but just cinematically really just give it a bit more width mm. oh no I think I'm, you know from just reading that and listening to people talk here it sounds great yeah. um, what about the uh the casting of it have you, have you, um... well I, I spoke to De Niro first about playing the main role and he didn't he wanted to play the devil so although he never said yes to it I then met with Mickey and I got on very well with him uh, you know right from the very beginning you know we met 
and we we spent we had lunch and then we sort of walked around the streets of New York and we sat on the step and watched the people go by until it got dark. It was a lot of you know it was instant rapport with an actor which you don't often have. Mm. I don't have it anyway. So that was nice, and he was enthusiastic about it. And I'm always enthusiastic about actors who are enthusiastic about me or the material, you know. And I have I, I admired him a lot for for a long time, you know. So. It, it fitted it right, so I thought, well, I've got Mickey, who I think is the best of his generation, and I've got De Niro, who's certainly the best of his. To have the two of them together is fantastic. Mm. Mm. What was it about Rourke, though, that intrigued? Mickey, well, because he's not a conventional American hero. You know, there's something wicked about him, something that is not clean-cut American, you know, and uh, he, he doesn't give a shit, really. To him, it's, it's a weakness to give a shit, and I quite like that in him. He is irreverent in the same way as I am. And we come from similar kind of backgrounds and uh, have similar attitudes to things. So in a way, I think if I'd have been an actor, that's the kind of actor that I would like to have been, you know. So you're kind of directing yourself out here, aren't you? Well, I don't know. I mean, he's, uh, he laughs at me when I, when I attempt to act. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, and the, the, what he is and what he represents, what he stands for, are all the things that I think I do. I mean, I think that I'm a little more responsible probably than he is. Uh, but uh, that's because I'm British as opposed to American. <laughs> but uh, no, I like him that he's, no, he's not. What, what is his background, I mean, in terms of Catholic, well, he's, presumably? Or? Yeah, he's Irish family. He's, uh, although he's very New York in everything about him, he actually was brought up in Florida in the South. Uh, oh, really? Quite a tough family. Yeah. Very tough indeed, you know. Had he, had five he... brothers. No, he's, I don't think... I think his father split when he was quite young. He was brought up by his... Uh, uh, stepfather, who I think was pretty tough on them, right. you know, the classic sort of American story, <laughs> yeah. which has made him very wary. Yeah, I mean, obviously he's he's an anti-hero in one sense of the film, mm. yet he's also the sympathetic character. Well, yeah, I mean, he, he the character ultimately, which I think why people like Redford uh, had a problem with it, is that uh, the character eventually turns out to be the ultimate evil but if you think, you know from an audience's point of view they've got to like the person all the way through so and they do you know i mean the way in which he he's kind of not slick he's kind of bumbling through it going from lead to lead uh, solving it in a, in a streetwise way but not knowing why mm. uh, and he's very likable and he's very and with the women in the story he is tremendous that's when he's at his best mm. he's, he works terrifically with, I mean the scenes with did with Charlotte Rampling were great and then what are the sympathetic scenes with women are they? very yeah mm. all three are yeah the three women in it because this is an interesting twist for him because in, in, uh, in uh, Year of the Dragon he was he was quite mm. a bloody like, chauvinist and, uh, and then he's not, not at all no not in any way quite the opposite mm. very gentle very likeable which is what he's, he's much more comfortable with I think mm. uh, and they're the nicest moments that I've done so far. Mm. Are the, those, you know, that, that have a certain sexual chemistry, which you definitely, you know, you don't choose. Know. What about Lisa Bonet? Was that a sort of a... Well, I never knew who she was. You know, I, only, I just looked at everybody who could play that part, you know. She's, uh, her father's black, her mother's white. Uh, I looked at all the sort of, that, that coloured, uh, you know... Um, We're just looking at light, photographs light skin. No, I mean, I saw every... I read everybody in New York and Los Angeles that was anything close to it, from all the actresses and all the pop singers, etc. Uh, and I didn't, I've never seen the, the Cosby show. It's actually a hugely successful thing here, you know, it's like the biggest thing ever on TV. Well, I haven't seen it either, so. But because of that, she's very, uh, you know, more people know her than probably Mickey. They don't even know De Niro down here, but they all know her. It's a strange thing, but it's the power of American television. And she's 18, very, uh, you know, very sensual, very worldly from a sexual point of view, which is right for the character. Uh, but she's still very young. She plays a 17-year-old in the film. Mm. So how did you come across her? I mean, was it by, did she come in as one of the people that you Yeah, just read? I read her very early on, you know, and I put everybody onto tape, which is what I normally do. Uh, and you run the tapes over and over again because you get punched on seeing so many people. Yeah. Uh, and I'd always, I went, I'd, the other day I went back to my notes to see what I did and I put fantastic early on, but could you, you don't trust it because she was like the sixth or seventh person That's right, you'd wait to get a better comparison. So I ended up, I must have seen 200 people for that role alone and uh, she was the best. Mm. The, um, 
does the film present any sort of difficulties in, in logistics and shooting, as for instance Birdie did with the uh, uh, with the uh, the camera and so on? Um, no, it's kind of fun in a way, you know, because it's uh, because of the nature of the story. Uh, stylistically, I think it fits our kind of work very well. Um, it's you know, it will look like one of our films. I mean, I don't. We haven't done anything, uh, you know, that one could call breakthrough like we might have done with Birdie, where I had to do the flying and things like that. It's uh, it's it's a colour film, but it, it looks like a black and white movie, and you know, we've saturated all the colours. Mm. So I was going to ask you about that. Well, only that I say saturate. What we've done is to t- is to take away all colour. So everything is muted colours from the point of view of, of the you know the sets and the clothes and the so the reds are sort of brown and the yeah and it's brown. Right. All, all of it is muted, so which gives it a really very rich feel. You know. But uh, it's nice, you know, just have fun. I mean, I keep we keep doing shots. I keep thinking, oh, I remember doing this on Midnight Express or whatever, you know. But the kind of the kind of story that it is, it it, it lends itself to it. Much, yeah. you know, so. so is it an easy film to do then? Yeah, well, it seems to be relatively. Easy. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, none of them ever are, of course. But I mean, it's uh, um, it, it's difficult in that there's 72 locations, you know, because mm-hmm. of the kind of story. You know, each scene, from writing point of view, is difficult in so much each scene has to give you more information about the overall story. It's quite a complicated story. Keeping it uh, entertaining and yet still giving the audience information that was difficult uh, from the book, where you can just keep. You, so much information is given that is not part of the dialogue yeah. and uh, not to resort to a voiceover which at the moment I haven't done um, but uh, just being in a different place you know I'm here this morning and I'm somewhere else this afternoon you know that's been quite difficult logistically what about the, the voodoo side of it did you do any research on that at all or? yeah I mean the voodoo part of it is minimal in so much as uh, you know the, the girl of epiphany that Lisa Bonet plays um, is involved in that, but it's she's involved in voodoo. The character himself that we're looking for, that the detective is looking for, is involved in in Satanism and other. So, what I want is to make it totally believable and not be oh god, you know, another hokey horror movie. It isn't that the only way I knew how to do it is to try and make it real. Voodoo is is taken very seriously down here, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you did you come down and talk to anybody about it? Yeah, before? I came down here uh, before I decided to, to move it to New Orleans. It fitted better here than in Harlem, where I didn't have a lot of luck with uh, the, the voodoo side of things. Although I did try, you know. I mean, I, and uh, the Harlem Library is where I got most of my stuff from, actually. Uh, and I've I've got textures of of fringe religions running throughout the whole thing, whether they're you know legitimate and conventional. Uh, and acceptable, or whether they're unacceptable, as certain uh, areas of voodoo and, and Satanism are unacceptable. I've also played that against Catholicism and Baptist, Baptist you know, things. Mm. So that to say that there's perhaps there isn't a lot of difference anyway. But they're all subtextures, really. They're not the main. Well, thing. What I was getting at really was, did you when you came down here to sort of make sure you had the milieu right? Did you come across people who actually practice voodoo and? Do yeah, you do. But it down here yeah, we've done that. I mean, I did that when I first came. It's very hard to uh, to bridge the gap between that which is real and truthful, which is uh, people's you know devout beliefs, which they keep very secret, than what is what I call the holiday in cabaret. There's a lot of that, and there's a lot of people who are supposedly the fire and the experts. Yeah, I mean, I, I went, I waded through a whole lot of rubbish really to to get to talk to people who really do know but uh, and are there people it, who do know yeah I mean it's uh, not so much here in the audience but certainly out in the country where we were you know um, well, the Cajuns uh, Cajuns which are well, the, well, whites it's generally amongst the blacks although a lot of the whites do do uh, believe too but it's what's uh, the essence of it I mean what do, what do they believe what is, what is it that they're supposed to sort of get out of it well it's just it's uh all things have spirits to be in uh, and to and to get in touch with those spirits. It's uh, I don't know. I wish I knew enough. I don't know enough about it to give you an intellectual or no, a theological no, no, just, answer, you know. But I mean, it's uh, but just it's, a, a, a guts. It's just what 
what I mean, its origins were from Africa to Hi- to Haiti, and obviously from Haiti to here. Right. And it's uh, it's just a merging of uh, of African ritual with uh, Cath- Catholic uh, beliefs in the spirit. You know? mm. Mm. So, and from point of view of, of, of things that are unattractive, are the sacrifices, you know, which is you know generally things mild things, you know, like chickens, which looks horrible when you cut one's throat, as we've done. You go home and, well, you know, everybody says to me, have you gone too far? You know, you've slit somebody's throat on screen yet again, uh, over the top, typical park of rubbish. And then you, if they all break and they go to the catering truck and get their uh, leg of chicken, you know. Leg of chicken, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, how do you react, though, to people who say, oh, you've gone over the top again? Well, no, you know me, I never apologise for what I do. No. I do it because I believe in it being right, and I don't, I don't pull punches. This is a very scary film, so, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of... Uh, documentary videotapes of real Haitian rituals uh, which I've tried to, to, to match and they're pretty horrible to, to watch uh, but, it, but none of it is actually is explicit on screen I gather you've sort of well, taken it to a point and then yeah, the rest of the imagination I mean the voodoo again I said the voodoo is only one tiny aspect of what our movie is about it's not about voodoo it just happens no. that that girl happens to be in, in it when Epiphany one of the characters you know but uh, it deepens the uh, it, it's just it's all to do with belief and whether it be a belief in, as I said, in voodoo or Satanism, which is yeah, another level yeah. of it, or whether it be conventional belief, it's to do with why people need these beliefs, you know. To mm-hmm. do, and that's as, just as much with conventional religion as it is those. So, uh, I, you know, I, as an observer, you think, well, I don't... These people do believe it. And uh, the character the, in the film, she believes in it. And uh, therefore, I show it for as real as possible, and I treat it as if I was filming uh, something at the Vatican. To me, it's just as important. It's just a religious belief. I don't mm. think I don't find it ugly. Uh, perhaps you know, sacrificing an animal does seem ugly, but again, that's part of the duplicity and uh, of, 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 of society, really. You know. mm. Can I just go back to uh, that first meeting with Mickey Rourke? Um, do you do you remember it at all? Clearly, I mean, what? Yeah, but what was he like when he came in, or you came in to see him? Well, he was in New York, and I was in New York, and it was arranged for us to have lunch. We had lunch, as I say, which went very well, uh, and then. Uh, but was he guarded or? Uh, not at wary? all. No, no, he was very easy. Yeah. I think he, you know, they're all guarded to a certain extent, and they can soon tell in ten minutes. I mean, they have to go through these meetings with directors, whether they have a rapport with a director or not. You can generally, you know, same with me with an actor, and. Uh, it was pretty, you know, we, we, we befriended one another quite soon. Mm. And as I say, we spent a long time with one another, we were just walking around, and we sat, and we were just, it was just nice sitting there on the stone steps, and we just watched New Yorkers walk by. Where, where about, about. This is up on, uh, we met up on, uh, on Madison, about 60th, but I remember sit, sitting there. And then he was going to go and see David Bowie, to talk to him about some music for something he wanted to do. So we then went to Bowie's recording studio and we sat talking to Bowie for a while. It was a really nice day. It was like, you know, it just went very easily. Mm. Whereas, you know, I've had meetings with actors, you know, where it's it's infinitely more difficult. I mean, De Niro is much, much more difficult. And now he has opened up, but he is so guard, desperately guarded about himself and his privacy and, and letting you know anything of what he's thinking. You know. mm. Really? Even with a director? I find that astonishing. Well, no, what he does is, I mean, he took a long time to make his mind. He only made his mind up two weeks before I started shooting. And that was, you know, I get a lot of pressure, you know, well, what if he says no? And I said, oh, I couldn't even comprehend uh, anybody but him doing it, which is dangerous for a director, because if they say no, then you're really, you know, in the shit, mm. because who do you get? And what he did, we met and we talked, and we went through every single little aspect and detail of the character and the script. And uh, he's just testing you and testing you and testing you until you pass the test, you know, and I say two weeks before, and he said, I'm of a mind to do it. And I sort of looked. Uh, sides with relief. What was he? What, what seemed to be his doubts or his concerns or whatever about it? Uh, no, it's just I think it's a process that he goes with with everything. You know, Roland said it took him a, a year to get him to do the mission. You know, uh, he's a very careful man. Mm. You know, uh, and he's not made many mistakes in his career. No. So in a way, he's got to be very wary. Also, uh, he plays the devil. Now. That for a, for an actor obviously is a great challenge. How do you play the devil though? It's very difficult to know, you know. So in looks, how is he playing? It's uh, it's very powerful, very strong. I mean, it's uh, it's not caricature in any way. 
but he's a pretty strange individual, that's for sure, you know. But there are little ha things that he likes and works with all the time. For instance, uh, he has false nails, because I, I wrote in the thing, he had, his na uh, he had these long nails, long, long t slender fingers. Uh, it said uh, Jack the Ripper could have had such fingers, or, or Hitler, or somebody. And so he want, his fingers aren't nailed, so that he, he, we have false nails which take an hour to put on every morning. And we had them on, and we had somebody fire them down an, an eighth of an inch, and then I had to go and have a look at them again, what do you think? Another little eighth of an inch, I mean, the, the, the amount of tension. The cane that he holds, we went through 50 canes to get the one that was absolutely perfect for him. The hair, a lot of... Is it his hair. own hair, is it? Oh, yeah. And he's still got it long from... Gin and bun. In the back. Uh, and makeup, any eye makeup or anything like that? No, uh, there'll be... Uh, we've been experimenting with contact lenses, which we'll... We've done two scenes, he has two more scenes. Uh, and the final scene, when we know that he is the devil, because you don't really know to begin with, uh, he'll look different, which is what we call the De Niro moment, you know, when you go, when you go, oh, Jesus. Yeah. What colour, what colour uh, eyes? contact lenses? I don't know yet, because I've tested every colour, you know. He won't be happy until he has at least 20. So he really doesn't have a big part in the film, but obviously no, no, it's the key part well, it's the, the beginning yeah. and the end. In the classic detective story, he's the man who hires the private detective to look for a man. Right. Turns out that he's the devil. Uh, but he, he's completely, you know, he permeates every single aspect of the movie. Mm -hmm. And his performance is so powerful anyway. I mean, it's, uh, it's incredible to watch. But do you see him in the middle of the film? I mean, do we, do we he, keep oh, going all, back then? Oh, he's all the way through the film, yeah. Oh, he is? It's right. just that he's dispersed. You know. Oh, it's just that you said that you, you've done two scenes with him and you've got two more to do. Yeah, but, that's, yeah, but in the film it's... Uh, it's pretty well balanced, you know. Right. Just that we did two in New York and we do two, actually three in uh, in New Orleans. Right. Yeah. And he's doing a play anyway. Yes, I see. So, he's got very good reviews. Yeah, he's, he's smack yet. Yeah, it's yeah. Pretty, pretty good. Have you seen it, have you? Yeah, yeah. I saw it uh, in preview before we came away, but he's finishing that and then he's coming down here for our last week of filming. So in a way, we didn't want him to the end so he could get on with his play. Right. Alan went on to mix writing and directing feature films with producing and directing music videos several times working with Madonna, his star, of course, in Evita. His later films included Angela's Ashes and The Commitments. He became a major force in the British movie industry, but also presented lectures to young filmmakers all over the world. Alan died in July 2020 at the age of 76.